and welcome to today's Lunch and Learn clinical webinar series. This is our, fir our fourth week with ICL um, on our integrated health webinar series for the month of October. And today's webinar is called Culture, Spirituality, and Community, Reaching Out to Address Health Disparities. Today we have Raymond Alberts and Jason Chang presenting and I'm going to let them introduce themselves, but I also want to really thank ICL for all their hard work this month. We've really enjoyed hearing from you each week, and, and thank you so much for sharing your, your, all of your information and expertise around integrated health. So Raymond and Albert, please begin, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Uh, so this is Jason Chang. Uh, if, if you were on the first webinar three weeks ago, you may remember me from that one. I'm the Director of Integrated Health at the Institute for Community Living. And joining me is Raymond Alberts, who is uh, director of one of the clinics where we are providing integrated care services. So uh, let me just start with this slide uh, with various photos of our consumers. This is really why I do the work that I do. Um, as you can see, people are having fun. They're doing meaningful work around people that they like. And beyond just trying to control symptoms, um, you know, we're, we're really trying to have people lead fulfilling lives um, and do the things that they like, and that's what we're about. So a little bit about our agency. We're a not-for-profit in New York City. We have over 100 programs serving about 10,000 consumers, most of whom are in Brooklyn. We have housing programs, case management, ACT teams, mental health clinics, homeless shelters, a health home program, and the New York State PROS program. Uh, you may remember, if you've been on a previous webinar, that we are providing primary care services at two of our mental health clinics and the PROS program. And then we've also mentioned uh, nurse care manager service that are at our three mental health clinics. Also relevant, I think, here is that we founded a medical clinic called Healthcare Choices which has since become its own standalone fairly qualified health center. Diagnosis-wise, we have over 70% of consumers with either schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder in our housing and case management programs. Uh, uh, different programs might be able, like, may vary from that, but that's at least our housing and case management. And like many social service organizations, our workforce is primarily paraprofessionals. So uh, as was mentioned before, this is the last installment of our integrated health series. We began with an overview of our behavioral health medical home model in which we're trying to pay attention to physical health issues within our behavioral health settings. We talked about the role of disease management in our model and gave some examples for the second webinar we moved on to talking about some of the workbooks and the electronic tools that we've put together in order to, um, to uh, support our behavioral health clinicians in, in doing this work. And finally, we're going to end with this webinar that talks about the role that cultural, spiritual, and community factors play in delivering integrated health services. At the end of this webinar, we are hoping that you'll be able to first describe how individual, cultural, structural, and community factors contribute to health disparities, that you'll also be able to approach individuals' whole health in a culturally humble and spiritually sensitive way with the context of community, and that finally you'll be able to strategize interventions at the individual program and community levels that can help address health disparities in your area. So the outline for today uh, is going to start out with us talking about health disparities and the reasons for them. Then we'll talk about the different levels uh, at which you can think about health disparities and begin to address them. So those are the individual program or clinic and community contextual levels. All right, so a uh, little bit about health disparities. So. Uh, the crisis is that uh, a lot of the consumers that we see, those with serious mental illness, die on average 25 years earlier than uh, those in the general population. That's a whole generation earlier. 
60% of this excess mortality is due to treatable and preventable medical conditions, and this amounts to about 40,000 people with serious mental illness dying uh, prematurely each year. From the physical health side, there's a lot of research on racial and ethnic disparities related to physical health. For example, hypertension is experienced at a 40% greater rate in African Americans as opposed to Caucasians. And when you look at diabetes, uh, uh, African Americans, Native Americans, and Latinos are each at least 1.7 times as likely to have diabetes as someone who is Caucasian. On the mental health side, there's disparities as well. So there's research showing that uh, minority populations receive less mental health care overall. This is especially true of mood and anxiety disorders. These disparities have not improved over the past decades. Uh, specifically, minorities also receive less psychotherapy, have a shorter visit duration, and receive worse care. And obviously, this leads to uh, worse outcomes. So reasons for these disparities, uh, certainly it's true that, uh, you know, depending on the culture, there may be uh, a lot of stigma against mental illness and its treatment, and so uh, there, there is a preference um, among some folks that uh, they, they not get treatment, so, so that's one reason. Another reason would be bias on the part of the provider that may lead to worse quality care or shorter visit duration. There's also structural barriers lack of insurance, the places where services are provided. Uh, you know, certain institutions may have uh, a bad uh, reputation in, in the community, um, or it may be located in a place where it's, it's hard for folks to get to. There's also cultural access barriers, such as uh, not having language services. Um, some folks prefer to have a provider of the same race or ethnicity, and that person may not be available. And then finally, the issue of whether the providers themselves are um, not only willing, but have the experience and expertise to be able to bridge cultural gaps. We'll talk about the, cult, uh, the concept of cultural hum humility in a little bit. And not to forget community and contextual factors. So here's a few points that Childhood poverty is associated with issues with cognition, school achievement, behavior, delinquency, and both childhood and adult mental disorders. Now, adult poverty is associated with depression, anxiety, and suicide. And when you look at poor neighborhoods as a whole, that uh, you often find high unemployment, crime, adolescent delinquency, social disorder, uh, physical disorder of the neighborhoods, single parent households, and residential mobility. Uh, now, these are a lot of these are national uh, statistics. Um, what about New York State? So, a full 11% of all immigrants in the U.S. live in our state, and 22% uh, of our population are immigrants. Uh, related to this, of residents in the state five years and older, 13% uh, speak English less than very well. And just looking at that another way that amounts to 2.3 million New Yorkers being limited English proficient. Rates of uh, not having insurance vary by uh, racial group. So 27% of Latinos, 16% of Blacks, 14% of Asian Pacific Americans, and 9% of Caucasians do not have insurance in the state. All right, so we're talking about integrated care. Um, so how can this address health disparities? Now, I, I, I'm assuming that most, if not all, the folks listening on this uh, are representing mental health clinics. Um, and we're talking about providing physical health care within, within those settings. Now, the research has actually looked at when things go in the other direction. In other, in other words, providing mental health treatment in primary care settings. So there is a model of depression care that does that called collaborative care, and it's the most heavily researched model out there, and it has been shown to improve access to depression care and improve depression outcomes for ethnic minorities. Uh, you know, there could be many reasons for this. One that I've seen uh, talked about uh, makes a lot of sense to me, and, and that's just that 
again, going to that, back to that issue of stigma, if uh, someone has a lot of stigma against uh, mental illness, then they're not going to want to be seen walking into a mental health clinic. Um, now, if you can provide those services in a primary care setting, then they, they may be more likely to get that treatment. Now, on the flip side, many of you probably know consumers who feel more comfortable in a mental health setting, and it, it's the primary care building where they, they don't quite feel at home. So for those folks, if we pro provide the services at the mental health clinic, then we're hoping that we can address health disparities that way. All right, so we can look at it at different levels. So there's the individual and clinical level, which we can address using approaches of cultural humility and spiritual sensitivity. Uh, moving up a level to the program or clinic, the integrated care can help, as I just mentioned, and also attention to the class standards. Uh, more on that later. And finally, broadening things even further to the community and contextual level and having awareness of the factors and uh, addressing them uh, with our clients. All right, so just, so just starting out with the individual level, we have the, uh, this schematic of the treatment relationship. So of course, the individual has a culture. That's what we often think about. The clinician, of course, has a culture as well. And when you get two people together, there, there's a culture that comes out of that relationship as well. So things get pretty complicated quickly. So how do we, how do you deal with all this? Well, there's this approach called cultural humility. A lot of people think that this takes things a step further beyond cultural competence, which at least by some definitions represents uh, gaining knowledge about specific groups. Um, now the issue with that, of course, is that um, there's many different kinds of cultures. You can't possibly know everything about every one of them. And so, you know, this is more about a process as opposed to a particular a goal that you can reach of cultural competence. Um, it's, you know, it's something that you have to learn about uh, throughout life. You're always meeting people from uh, cultures that you're not being exposed to. An important piece is critical self-reflection. We all have biases. Uh, and it's important to acknowledge them, realize the impact they have on you, and that knowledge allows you to minimize the impact it has on your effectiveness as a clinician. It's better to do that as opposed to like having biases, but um, acting as if you don't and they, they come out in, in effective ways. It's also about recognizing power imbalances, but more importantly, being able to challenge them because that's the only way that uh, things change. Another important aspect is, is uh, not taking a paternalistic approach to clients, but really uh, treating the, um, the services as more of a partnership where you negotiate together what you're going to do going forward. It's important to have accountability uh, that's institution-wide. Institution and uh, finally, this is more just kind of a stance of given that you can't possibly learn everything about every culture, you're, you're always going to find out new things and enjoying the, the process of discovering new things and being comfortable um, not knowing and having a curiosity. So that's the concept of cultural humility. Now, the way that culture impacts diagnosis uh, the way we diagnose mental illness is uh, it relates to uh, what variations in behavior, belief, or experience are considered abnormal. Now, what, you know, for example, something that might be considered a delusion in uh, one culture, um, you know, it, it might actually be the belief that's held by that culture, and so um, we can run into problems uh, making diagnoses based on our cultural frame as opposed to the, the cultural frame that that person comes to. So the ways in which we can incorporate culture into our diagnosis, there may be multiple ways of doing this, but the one I know best is in the diagnostic and statistical manual that we use to diagnose psychiatric illness. So there's an appendix that, that has the cultural formulation, and uh, this is the outline of it, so it starts out with knowing about the cultural identity of the person, finding out about the way the individual conceptualizes distress, 
and the cultural aspects of that. Stressors and uh, supports and cultural features of uh, both of those things. Cultural features of the relationship between the individual and the clinician. And finally, of course, how you put it all together in a cultural assessment. So for that first piece of identity, there, there's some pretty uh, standard demographic things as well as others that we don't think about necessarily as much, sort of potentially a, uh, a rural versus urban culture. Um, certainly New York State is, uh, you know, New Yorkers may have a reputation across the country, but there's a lot of uh, uh, variation across the state um, and certainly understanding that and respecting that culture of uh, lifestyle, like vegetarianism, of uh, being highly active and being really sporty. Um, those are other aspects of a person's identity, political orientation, disability status, whether someone's immigrated or not, how far along um, are they on their trajectory of uh, being adjusted to a new country. Those are, those are all parts of a um, person's identity. And that last piece of acculturation I'll, I'll talk about in a little more detail later. The second piece of the DSM cultural formulation involves uh, how the individual conceptualizes his or her distress. So these are some questions that you can ask to assess that. So what are the main problems your mental health concern has caused you? What do you think caused them? What do you fear most about your problem? What kind of intervention do you think you should receive? And what are the most important results you hope to receive from the service that we're providing you? So this is important in the sense that just as when I make a diagnosis that uh, affects the kind of treatment that I recommend, uh, in a similar way, an individual's perception of what's causing his problem is going to affect how he thinks it should be treated. And if, if those two perspectives are too far apart, then, then he's simply not going to do the recommendation that, that we give him. Here are some examples of cultural practices that you know, someone coming into the clinic may, may think is the appropriate way to address their concern. I'm not going to read it all, but just to give you a sense of um, some of what's available. And this, is, of course, is only a drop in the bucket. So the, the third part of the DSM cultural formulation are the cultural aspects of the psychosocial stressors and supports. So, Supports may include religion, it could uh, include family networks, and uh, stresses could include the fact that someone's immigrated or having difficulty adjusting to a new society. So these, these two pictures illustrate that a little bit. So on, on the left here is an older man dressed traditionally. On the right side are a group of young men. Um, they appear to be... Um, of uh, different ethnic backgrounds, and you can imagine that uh, they're sort of um, jockeying with each other, finding a group. These are these are friends, but they're just trying try to figure out their place in the world and their place in the group, and th that relates to this complicated process of um, of how to mix their the culture of their family with uh, the culture of the land that they've moved to. Okay, so the fourth part of the DSM culture formulation is uh, looking at the treatment relationship. So when there are cultural differences, how do you navigate them? The cultural humility helps, of course, that, that concept of cultural humility that I mentioned earlier. And also uh, knowing that the clinician not only has a culture just from being a person with, with a background, but has a culture from, from training. And, what kind of biases and um, sort of uh, uh, ways of looking at the world does that entail? And uh, how, does, how does the consumer respond to that training as well? Now, uh, you know, we often see similarities as being able to facilitate therapeutic engagement. That's certainly true, but uh, there, there's also an associated issue where either the clinician or the consumer can assume that some some beliefs are in common based on uh, perceived um, shared culture, and sometimes that assumption is not right. So that's just something else to watch out for. 
All right, so to wrap it up, this is a mnemonic that I think is helpful to think about how we uh, use the cultural assessment in terms of um, you know, what we actually do with the consumer. So, so it's learn, so starting out with listening with sympathy, then explaining your perception of what's going on. Um, as I mentioned before, there, there may be some differences between those perspectives. And if you leave it at that, then the, the client may not follow the treatment plan. So really having a discussion about any differences uh, between your perspectives. At that point, you have more solid footing to re recommend a treatment that you think that the client will accept and that you, you think will be helpful. And uh, there may be further negotiation after that. So that's kind of how that process goes. And the way culture fits into integrated care, uh, one way that we thought of uh, here at ICO, we uh, sometimes will run cooking demonstrations or we, we have a nutritionist talk about healthy food choices. And in those kinds of activities, we try to incorporate people's uh, cultural perceptions of the kind of food that they should eat. Because if you're recommending something that it just is completely foreign to them, then they're just not going um, to eat it and they're going to go back to what they were eating before. So that's something important to think about in integrated care. OK, so with that, um, we're going we're gonna to turn things over to uh, Raymond, who's uh, going to continue on this discussion of the one-on-one -on -one clinical work talking about spirituality. And uh, he's also going to talk about um, uh, the program and clinic level, um, some of the things that ICL is doing in terms of the class standards. No, I got it. Hello. Okay, here at the clinic, okay, um, looking at the slides, you can see, first we're talking about religion and spirituality, okay? Spirituality is about one's relationship with the transient questions, including those of meanings, that confront one as a human being and how one relates to these questions. So one can look at spirituality as one's decision on how one wants to be in the world, how one wants to present themselves in the world, and how they wish to go forward. Religion can be seen as a set of texts, practices, and beliefs about the transient shared by a particular community. So one can, again, look at religion as a, as a set of rituals, beliefs, practices shared by the group. The distinction is blurry, blurry but Again, it is important for one to question these to, to, because both of these within minority communities are many times is seen as important and what gives the person strength. Spirituality can offer better control, faster, or easy recovery as it focuses on strengths. Okay? One of the important things to remember in substance abuse and addictions, okay? There's a very large spirituality in those treatments. Those treatments focus on strengths. Those clients wish to be seen as someone outside of their addiction. Religious practices can offer access to a sacred space, a place for, for people to go and share in community, access to connection with others through activities and feelings of self-worth. Many times clients within minority communities and going to a religious sacred space will have many activities in which they share with others in the activities and feel good. In com minority communities, it is many times a sacred space that a person will go if the outside community sees them as less than or other than. Okay, outside of family, many times it's a rig religious place. Religious practices in these places can be a resource for the mental health provider working with the client, okay? One dramatic example is spirit possession, okay? How does one relate to a client, okay, when that client is saying that they feel that they may be an issue of uh, bad karma, spirit possession, and that they're in conversation with their uh, religious provider? Okay, assessment of meeting, okay? 
this works for all clients, okay? Um, to get an idea of what keeps them going in hard times. What role does forgiveness of oneself or others play in your life? How do you, how do you see your life and where do you wish to go with it? This will give you a better idea and it gives you an idea of what it is that the client sees as important. What, what are they, what are their strengths? How do they see their strengths in terms of self-report? Forgiveness, okay? How many times of our clients or how many times as providers do we play a part in having the client hear negative messages about themselves? Okay, assessment of religious background. Okay, this is regarding religious practices. What religion did your family follow? Do you practice it presently? Do you believe in God or a higher power? Do you see or believe God is forgiving, punishing, or understanding? This, okay, would again give you a better understanding of the client's self-view of themselves. Okay? Okay, assessment of spirituality. Do you follow any spiritual practice or tradition? Examples include prayer, meditation, breathing, yoga, and chanting. Okay? There are many spiritual practices that clients follow, and it gives them a sense of well-being. Okay? Ever have a spiritual experience, an aha moment, or an awakening from meditation? There are times in which clients will be in recovery, and if you will ask them what was the decision that came about that made them move and change behaviors, okay? Any clubs or groups that give you a sense of grounding purpose or connection that helps you in recovery from a problem, okay? There are many times that, again, asking these questions, right, you may find that a client may tell you that there was a time in which they were with a group. They were with a club and they felt connected. There was a time in which that they felt that that was the best time of their life or when they left that group that they had difficulties. And being able to have them reconnect with that sense of strength I will help them in their recovery. What is, spirituality and integrated care. What are your beliefs about self-care? Okay. How do you feel about the, your physical health? What's important to you? Do you believe that you can actually change your physical health? Ideas of the body as a temple or a gift. Does your spiritual community offer support around wellness and the health? Okay. So when one looks at this, okay, is it important? Is it a value, okay, for your family, for your community, that you be healthy, that you take care of yourself, and you do well? Okay. Now, moving into treatment. For us as providers, okay, we would be, then be able to, to – look at based on your answers to ask the client, how can I use them in your recovery or treatment? Can I involve them? If I call them, what would you like me to, to speak to them about? If you're having difficulties, can I reach out to these people? By looking at the person in totality, therapists can assist the whole person in treatment and recovery, okay? As we move to more of a trauma-informed care, this is where we're moving. Okay, we're moving to this because I, the medical model, okay, we need to look at people outside of their symptoms and their problems. If we're moving towards a strength base, I, then looking at the person totally and using their strengths will help them uh, obtain their goals. Okay. The program level in integrated care, okay, here at the clinic, okay, you can take a look at this circle and you can see all the people that play a part, okay, in the integrated care. And, and what's also very important about integrated care is the increasing of the scope of practice, okay? If you take a look, okay, you, you, you look at everyone involved, social workers need to in increase their scope of practice, meaning that they are looking at the medical issues, and they're looking at the connections. The doctors are looking at 
okay, not only the symptoms, but looking at, okay, the medical, looking at what is the relationship to that, getting family and friends involved. We have a nurse practitioner, okay, who outreaches, a peer coach, so that everyone is on the, the same page, but also in Increasing the scope of practice is the ability to listen, okay? And when someone says, okay, that they're having an issue, to listen to with an open mind. The National Cultural and Lististic Appropriate Services Standards of Health and Healthcare, okay? These are standards that you can Google and it'll give you an idea, okay, of where we are at this point. So the standard, it provides effective, equitable, understandable, and respectful quality care and services that are responsive to diverse cultural health, beliefs, practices, preferred languages, health literacy, and other communication needs. All ICO employees receive cultural training during orientation. ICL hires staff for cultural and language abilities reflected of the population served. Psychosocial assessments at intake identify our clients' cultural background and needs, as well as linguistic needs, and to begin treatment with a cultural, humble outlook. The idea of not knowing, the idea of not judging, okay? The I idea of assisting clients with strengths the idea of exploring what has worked in the past. The ICL Rockaway Parkway Clinic has a written notice in Russian of the right to receive language services. A similar notice in Spanish was developed for the ICL Highland Park Clinic. These are integrated care sites. ICL self-management workbooks and other health-related materials are available in Russian and Spanish. Phone translation services are available when staff cannot speak the language of a person served. Okay, ICL, engagement and continuous improvement and accountability, okay? So as you are setting up these services, okay, getting feedback about what is working, but also not only getting feedback about what was working, is getting an idea of what it is that the clients really want, what would be helpful for them. So we run focus groups that occur regularly at the integrated health sites when the majority of populations are minority background. Integrated health outcomes are tracked by race and ethnicity. So we take a look at some of the medical um, outcomes. ICO has a diversity council that is involved in training cultural and events oversight of policies and paperwork, and creation of an open and respectful work environment. Membership includes our consumers. Community level. Okay. All right, thanks, Raymond. Uh, that's a nice summary of um, the different uh, uh, categories of class standards and ways in which we are beating them. Um, some of these apply to our integrated care programs, uh, the three sites where we're, um, we're providing primary care services, others are agency-wide. So that wraps up the, the program um, level, and uh, we want to next turn our attention to the third uh, way of, or third level at which we can look at health disparities and how to address them, and that's the community level. All right, so you may have seen this from a previous webinar, so this is the chronic care model. Um, we'll, we'll sort of emphasize a different part of it. So again, the core is to have an, an informed, activated individual who is supported by a prepared, proactive practice team. In previous webinars, we've talked a lot about um, the, the right part of the health system and the way it's organized. Uh, so for self-management, we've developed some workbooks. For decision support, we have some electronic tools that support our behavioral health clinicians in keeping track of uh, physical health issues. Um, do you want to take a moment to uh, talk about a learning collaborative that we're setting up? So some of these resources uh, we, we want to make available to those of you who are interested in 
uh, in applying them to your own mental health clinic. And so if you're interested in that, please uh, get in touch with us. We have contact info at the end of uh, this webinar. Now, the most relevant part of this model for, for this part of the webinar is the community resources and policies. So this really involves knowing um, uh, resources that are out there. Uh, some of them are cultural and spiritual, like um, religious places of worship. Uh, these are places that you can partner with in terms of both mental health and physical health endeavors. And uh, there, there's various other um, you know, clubs or other cultural groups that you can get involved with as well. So that's how community fits into this chronic care model. All right, so we talked about some, some of the issues with the connection between poverty and mental illness that was at the beginning of the webinar. So these are things just to take into account and to try to really break the link. Now, poverty is associated with mental illness, but it, it doesn't mean that it necessarily will lead to it as long as there's some protective factors. So um, one of those can be families, so it, it's usually helpful to involve families as well. So uh, what can we do? So besides providing clinical services, which uh, I think it's uh, what we're most comfortable doing, uh, it may involve referral to psychosocial programs, community development organizations, social service agencies, sources of economic support, and I would add housing programs as well. Now what can we do beyond uh, referring out? Uh, the ICL is a pretty big agency, so we're able to provide some of these in-house. So, so things involve care management for the whole person. So if you remember what Raymond was saying about that, that circle diagram, uh, there's various, you know, there's the physical health, there's the mental health, but, you know, there, there's other providers who are looking at employment, who are looking at um, you know, entitlements, and a care manager is someone who's able to liaison with each of these different kinds of specialties or areas um, to be able to manage the care of the whole person. Now we're really, really thinking about the ways in which diet and exercise impacts pe both people's mental health and their physical health. So what we try to do in um, all, of our, all of our 100 programs is to provide uh, trainings and wellness program, programming. We have like a fitness expert. Um, we have a nutritionist and providing services to each of these programs to help people pay attention to things like diet and exercise. Now, housing and employment are also important, so um, providing programs or specialists who can deal with these areas. Entitlements, of course, it's important for people to be able to have someone pay for care, so, so these specialists are able to provide um, access to insurance and new sources of income. Partnering with uh, places in the community. I mentioned religious uh, places of worship. Some of our programs offer coupons for local farmers markets. The Healthy Bodegas Initiative takes a look at the, you know, the many corner sto stores that are around New York City um, and encouraging them to stock um, healthy food options such as fruit. And really getting a, a good sense of uh, individual clients' trauma and sort of the trauma of the community and, and how you can both think about it and use that to address how you approach a client. So there's this idea of trauma-informed care that is very popular right now because of this. All right, so here are the take-home points. Integrated care can help reduce health disparities by improving access to care and accounting for the whole person. Cultural humility improves engagement with the client's reality, and in doing that, uh, improves the chance that they will follow a, a treatment plan that you mutually negotiate. Spirituality and religion are, are relatively neglected in uh, traditional assessments, but guides are available, such as the questions that we presented in this webinar. And uh, doing community outreach and advocacy helps create change. And finally, uh, I, I do urge you if, you, if you're not familiar with them, to, uh, to follow that link earlier in this webinar or just Google Class Standards and 
Uh, there's a new set of standards that came out earlier this year, and they're a good starting point for assessing how you're doing meeting the cultural and linguistic needs of your clients. All right, so here are uh, some of our references. <laughs> Just so you know that we're not making this stuff up. Uh, if you have any questions about the references or want to uh, want me to email you any, just feel free to contact us. Um, with that, I'm going to turn things over to uh, Kara in a little bit. Thank you so much, Jason and Raymond, for presenting and sharing with us some really important considerations around the culture, spirituality, and community levels and addressing those health disparities and helping people in the best way possible. Thank you so much. Um, I just, before we get, to, we do have some time for questions and answers. So but before we get to that, I just wanted to let everyone know that the slides will be available on our CTAC website at www.ctacny.com uh, later today or tomorrow. So you can access the slides and the webinar recording then. Um, I'm going to ask for people to chat in any questions. I didn't get any throughout the webinar, but if you have any questions right now for Jason or Raymond, please chat them in the chat box and, and we can get them answered. While we're waiting for any questions to come in, I just wanted to go over our upcoming CPAC events. On November 8th, this is a Friday and not a Wednesday, we're going to have Suicide Prevention Part 2 with Dr. Aruna Jha from 12 to 1. Uh, Dr. Aruna Jaw was with us uh, a few months ago, and this is a part two. We're also going to have trauma treatment in uh, December with Dr. Elizabeth Meeker. That's not here because we don't have a final day yet, but, but you can look forward to that as well. So any questions or concerns for Jason and Raymond? Nothing on your end of? Thank you. Well, I think um, Jason and, and Raymond are available for questions. Um, I also know they are going to have a learning collaborative where you can go deeper into some of these, these concepts with them, which may be really helpful. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jason to wrap things up. And if you have any last comments or or thoughts, Jason and, and Raymond. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks so much. Um, well, I would be remiss uh, if I didn't acknowledge all the people who um, put efforts into the work that we do. Um, these are just uh, a few of them. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we really also rely on the frontline behavioral health clinicians to, um, as Raymond said, expand the scope of practice to start dealing with physical health issues as well. Um, so special thanks to um, all of those folks. If you're interested in learning more about our behavioral health medical home model, um, uh, you can click on our website, iclinc.org, and there should be a, a link on that main page to, um, to the, the behavioral health medical home webpage. Uh, also, feel free to contact us at medhomes at iclinc.org with any questions or if you're interested in references. Um, again, I'll, I'll plug again a learning collaborative that uh, we're setting up to um, uh, share some of the, the experience, some of the tools that we developed for our behavioral health medical home model in case you're interested in um, uh, either improving your integrated care services or even uh, starting them from scratch. So uh, that's always a resource. So again, please email us at medhomes at icoinc.org. Um, and uh, given that this is our uh, last webinar for part series, it's been quite a ride. I uh, put a lot of work into this. And a very big thank you to the folks at CTAC. Um, so you guys are you know, clearly professionals. You've done this uh, a lot. And it was really helpful to have you every step along the way. Um, just so that uh, we had everything set um, so that, um, you know, things ran smoothly. So I, uh, Evelyn and Kara, I really want to thank you for um, the tremendous efforts that you put into this, uh, to this series of webinars.
Thank you, Jason. And we want to thank you and, and Raymond and, and your entire team because it's been really lovely to work with all of you. And I really think the information that you're sharing with our, our CTAC audience and everyone is so helpful and important. So thanks again. And to our audience, thank you for participating today. And please reach out to Jason or uh, anyone at ICL if you have further questions or if you want to join their learning collaborative. We hope everyone has a wonderful day, and we'll see you soon. Take care, everyone. Okay. Thanks for tuning in. Okay. Bye, guys. All right. Bye-bye.